my shit out. Yeah. I could come back. Oh, yeah. We've yeah. tried to come this small. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. We're attending another beautiful Friday lunch. Hopefully, the weather's not too bad for anyone. I had a few slips this morning myself, but um, it's not the same for everyone else. So, as always, we'll like to start off with any quarter deck updates. So, so yeah. this is not working again. All right. There are no career like updates at this time. <laughs> <laughs> the main attraction of today, uh, we'd like to introduce one of our more esteemed faculty members, Mr. Timothy McCoy. Uh, he is the instructor for 332. He also runs one of our graduate research projects. So I'd like to thank you. Thanks. Okay, so I agreed to do this and I asked Lisa what I should do. And she said, just talk a little bit about your background and uh, you know what you did before you came to Michigan and use lots of pictures. Um, so that's what I've done. Uh, this is scheduled for an hour and a half. There's no way I'm gonna take an hour and a half on this. Um, so yeah, a little bit about me. Uh, born and raised in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. Uh, anybody knows what is located in Champaign or Bain, Illinois? University of Illinois. University of Illinois. Uh, absolutely. Fighting Illini. Um, so I, uh, I was the youngest of eight children. That's a story in itself. Um, and something you guys would be interested in is I was only eight years old when I learned about ship stability, or in that case, it was boat stability. And basically, to make a long story short, uh, we were on vacation in Wisconsin. My nephew and I were out in my brother's rowboat that had a 10 horsepower motor on it. And my dad said, hey, he yelled at us. He says, hey, you boys come back to the pier and I'll show you how to run the motor. And of course, us being eight and four year old young boys that were fascinated with anything mechanical, we were like, sure. So we rowed the boat back to the pier and I told my nephew, I said, when grandpa gets in, he's going to get it on the side of the boat. We don't want to tip it over because we'd already been learned from my dad, never, ever stand up in a boat. So we scooted over to the side. It would be, I guess it would be the port side of the boat. And unbeknownst to us, my dad, when he stepped in the boat, he stepped, took a long step into the port side of the boat. So next thing I know, it was a nice sunny day. Next thing I know, it's dark, I'm wet. <laughs> and the boat's on top of me. <laughs> so that was my introduction to uh, ship stability. Um, so this is a uh, professional career. So I probably have the longest path to Michigan of anybody here, because uh, I actually didn't get to Michigan until I was 56 years old. Uh, so what I do, yeah, because I grew up in Champaign-Urbana, I went, it was kind of natural to go to University of Illinois. Uh, I started out at, at the junior college there, uh, Parkland College, did a two-year transfer program. Um, I actually started, I wanted to be an automotive engineer growing up. First, I wanted to be a race car driver, and then it's like, yeah, that's not going to happen because I don't have anybody in my family that's a race car driver. Um, and so then I decided to be an automotive engineer. And so the first thing I did at Parkland College is I took an auto mechanics course. And it was a year, a year long curriculum where it was, you know, hands on auto mechanics. Um, I never got the certificate. And the reason I didn't get certificate is because I didn't have the correct math courses. Because at, at the end of that, I was instead of taking technical math, which was like math 135, I decided to start my calculus sequence, right? Because I knew I was going to go on to engineering school. And uh, the uh, administrator there, it was, a, I guess, a, a guidance counselor, I guess you'd call it. He tells me, he says, well, you're taking Math 128, Calculus 1. You're supposed to take Math 135. Math 135 is a higher number. Therefore, you can't count Math 128 towards your automotive certificate. So I, that's why I never got my automotive mechanics certificate. Um, anyway, I worked my way through school. I know there's a number of people here that do that. Um, because my parents, uh, they, they told us we all had to go to college, but they couldn't afford to pay for it. So we paid our own way. 
I did end up as an automotive engineer briefly uh, for less than a year. I was at uh, Oldsmobile Product Engineering up in Lansing. So you may even remember what an Oldsmobile is. So they've been out of business for a number of years. Um, got laid off during a big recession uh, in uh, 83, 84 timeframe. My brother suggests I look in the military service. I first looked at the Air Force because I had uh, my sister's husband was in the Air Force. So I looked at that. Um, they were going to offer me to send me back to get a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering. And I'm like, well, I've already got a bachelor's degree. I don't need another one. Um, the Army, they said, uh, well, if you do real good at boot camp, we might send you off to training school. And I'm like, well, who designs your tanks and Jeeps and all that stuff? And the sergeant recruiter's like, well, I don't know. Um, so the Army didn't look too good. The Navy, they had this program in place. Engineering duty officer will send you to graduate school. They send you two places, either uh, Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, or they send you to MIT. And MIT sounded really good, so I joined the Navy. Uh, first thing you do when you join the Navy is, well, first you, you go to officer candidate school, and then I went to a, a surface warfare officer school in San Diego, and then I reported aboard my first ship, USS John Young. Um, was on that ship for almost three years. And then after that, I went to work in the shipyards in San Diego, and I'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. Um, then I went off to MIT, got my graduate degrees that was promised by the Navy, uh, was able to stay around. The, the normal program there is a three-year program, gets you a master's. MIT does everything different and backwards, right? So they have, instead of an MS, they give an, S, an SM, because that's the Latin. And I got the Naval Engineers degree, which is the standard program. And then I was lucky enough to get um, selected by the Navy to stick around an extra two years and do the PhD. And then the rest of my Navy career, I worked in uh, ship design, construction, and uh, research and development. Uh, last job in uniform was back at MIT uh, teaching the program there. Um, and that was probably the best job I ever had in the Navy. Uh, was doing that. And so I spent eight of my 22 years in uniform, actually not wearing a uniform, um, working at MIT. Um, so after I retired in 2006, um, my wife was had just finished up her PhD. Uh, she's an audiologist. And so she was in a faculty position at UBC in um, Vancouver, British Columbia at the time. So I went and uh, just did some consulting, worked for a consulting firm out of uh, the DC area. This is uh, the BMT logo. So you got logos of all the places I've worked, most of them anyway. Uh, did that for about a year. And then I got an offer to go work for a, a company called, at the time they were called Conver Team. And uh, they're now part of GE. And I was able to set up a new organization there, um, a new R&D organization. And then the Navy kept knocking at my door from about the time I started at Conver Team, they were asking me to come back to work for them. And finally in 2009, I relented and agreed to go back to Washington DC, which is kind of ironic because when I retired from the Navy out of this job, um, one of the reasons I retired at that point in time as a commander, instead of going on to make captain, which I would have been in zone for the following year, was that we didn't want to go back to DC. Um, and yet here we ended up back in DC. Um, and I did, we, I, I endured that for about five years, um, uh, living and working in DC and we finally had enough of it. And so I left my civilian job in the Navy and uh, started consulting practice in 2014. And I was happily consulting. And uh, Jing Soon had been after me to give a guest lecture up here at, at uh, U of M for a number of years, and I finally relented to do it in 2017. What she neglected to tell me is that they were recruiting faculty members. Um, and I found, out, I found out about that when they took me out to dinner but the night before my talk. Um, and I guess, as they say, the rest is history. So um, lots of pictures, right? So. One of the things, advice I would say for the students is if you can get some operational ex experience, do it. Now, I was lucky enough that as a uniformed officer, I was required to get operational experience. So I had three years aboard a ship. If you're uh, 
a civilian going to work for, for the Navy or a civilian going to work in the defense industry, there are ways you can get aboard Navy ships for short periods of time. Uh, if you're a civilian going to work for the cruise industry, oil and gas industry, boating industry, it's a lot easier to get aboard your operational ships. Get a chance to do it. If you get a chance, do it. Always do it. You learn a lot. You learn what works, what doesn't work. Um, just a few random photos uh, from my days at sea. Um, you can see a, a, a couple of underway replenishment fixtures. That's one of the things that the Navy does that's unique. Run ships alongside each other 150 feet apart uh, and refuel at sea. Um, the hydrodynamicists are going to get all excited about this ocean spray here off the bow. Just, you know, keep it to yourself. Uh, don't get too excited. And you see some beautiful sights out there, right? This is a, a USS Ranger sunset in the Indian Ocean. Um, and then I, I was telling the juniors about this a couple weeks ago. Um, this was the uh, at the time, Soviet Union bear aircraft. They were out looking for the aircraft carrier because they'd lost track of the Ranger. Um, and we had special equipment on board our ship that made us sound acoustically and electronically like the aircraft carrier. And so they were looking at us and they saw a destroyer, but their electronic countermeasures said they had an aircraft carrier in the area, but they couldn't find the aircraft carrier. Uh, drove them nuts. <laughs> And of course, the most important thing is the people you meet along the way. Uh, a few, just a few random photos of, uh, of some of the folks I worked with. Um, this is kind of interesting one over here. Back in that day, we didn't all have computers, right? And so somebody getting a new computer was a big deal. So you see everybody checking out the brand new, that was a, a brand new IBM, probably an 8088 processor or something like that. Goes back a few days. So eventually got into my engineering career. Uh, just list a few of the, the ships I worked on. The first one I worked on was AOE-6. Uh, that was before I went to grad school and uh, did a lot of different things on that ship. Worked on structures. We had issues with the longitudinal bulkheads on the ship. The cross section of that ship kind of looks like this. You got these two bulkheads, you got your double bottom in here. So you've got these big wing tanks on either side that are for cargo oil. And 30 feet off the center line, you've got longitudinal bulkheads that form part of the midship structure of the ship. And then in between here is the cargo holds for ammunition and stores and other stuff like that. And so there's like five, five or six decks here. And uh, one of the things that we found out was that there's a little rule of thumb, right? And so all the undergrads, is, you know, you guys are learning classes where we give you equations and it's sort of a, a plug and chug equation and it's al algebraic. So we had one of those in the spec. But the shipbuilder misapplied it. And they rounded down instead of rounding up. And so these plates, instead of being half inch plates, they were seven sixteenths inch plates. And so one of the things we got into was, well, the spec also allowed them to do a, um, what's called a uh, finite element analysis, right? Anybody done any of those? Nobody? A few people nodding their heads, okay. So they had some new graduate engineer, it was an MIT guy, um, came in, put together a finite element model of the ship, did all the, the flexing based on the sea state and stuff. And he showed that um, these, bulkheads were not going to break. Um, what he did find, though, was that there's a couple places where there's a deck and this bulkhead here, and there's a, a big web frame, part of the web frame here. So this location here is pinned in place in all three directions by other structure, right? You got a bulkhead, you got a deck, you got a web frame coming in here. It can't move. And in that very tiny location, the stress exceeded the buckling stress. Didn't exceed the yield stress, exceeded the buckling stress. And the guys at NAVC said, unacceptable, can't have it. And I hadn't been to grad school yet, and I knew that was wrong. Can anybody tell me why that was wrong? What does buckling happen? Where does buckling happen? 
Nobody? Not at a joint. What's that? Not at a joint. It, it can't it can't happen when a fixed location. Buckling happens. It's an instability, right? It's an instability. If you have a long, thin column, buckling's gonna happen here. Because you if you put a force here and a force here and compress it, and you, you get a little bit of bending, and then if you bend it too much, then it buckles, right? Well, buckling can't happen where everything is pinned in place. They might exceed the yield stress and, and break it, but you can't have buckling. So we fought that and fought that and fought that, and we finally lost. And they had to go off and backfit the ship with extra stiffeners on those bulkheads. Um, other things we did, um, aviation facilities. So here's one of the changes I personally did on this ship. When we got the design from NASC, we had a three bay helo hanger here. You see there's two there, right? There's two and then there's this passageway. Start out with three. Well, this gets back to the operational experience. Lieutenant McCoy knew from having been at sea and done underway replenishment a number of times and worked with these ships that when they deploy, they deploy with two helicopters. They don't deploy with three. So we're in San Diego at the time. Lieutenant McCoy goes over to North Island Naval Air Station, talks to the squadron commander of the squadron of the, not the H-60s, but the H-46s that we used to fly back then. He said, do you guys ever intend on deploying with three helicopters? And he's like, the, the squadron commander's like, well, no, we don't have enough birds to do that. We could never do that. So we were able to convince NAVC that we didn't need three hangars. And why did we do that? We had all kinds of problems here because uh, in a helicopter hanging, you've got to have white lights for daytime. You've got to have red lights for night. You've got to have cranes in there for servicing the helicopter. There's a whole bunch of HVAC that's up in this overhead as well because this ship has one of those Citadel collective protection systems in it that pressurizes the inside of the ship. So it all kinds of special HVAC requirements. We had EMI requirements on there, electromagnetic interference. Basically, we were trying to put 10 pounds of stuff in a five pound bag. And that solved the problem. Um, other problems we dealt with, um, start air issues, um, reduction gear. The reduction gear was, was a crazy, crazy, crazy late. Lot, learned a lot on that project. Um, so what else I worked on? Worked on Zoomwalt um, on and off for about 20 years. Uh, worked on that from concept design um, all the way through uh, late stage testing of equipment. Um, later in uh, about the same time I did that, we, were, we did, worked with the Brits on the research vessel Triton. That's a trimaran hull form. It was built to be a hull form demonstrator, but we talked them into making it an electric drive ship so we could also use it as an electric drive demonstrator. Um, did some work on the uh, um, in my civilian job at NAFC, we worked on the Flight 3 DDG-51, uh, redid the power system on that ship. Um, also worked on the competition for the LHA-8. Um, did an interesting design on that. Ends up it wasn't selected, but that's okay. Other projects we worked on. Um, San Antonio, um, that was... Uh, after the electric propulsion stuff, I was in charge of all the all the efforts in Maine because uh, uh, that was an interesting exercise where the, the prime contract was out of Avondale and New Orleans, subcontract to Bath Ironworks in Maine. We were originally supposed to build every fourth ship up in Maine. Um, there was no technical problems with that, but the contractual relationship was just such a mess. Um, that we finally gave up. We did get uh, part of it built though. This is some pictures from the start fab ceremony where we started, started construction. I had to make a speech. I was the president of BIW. This is Lloyd Beckett, who was the program manager for BIW. And then there's the guys cutting the first plate. Uh, we got most of the inner bottom units built when uh, word came through that we were gonna stop building them up there and ship everything down to Avondale. Uh, so we had to barge down a whole bunch of steel and parts and uh, 40 train car loads worth of equipment and about 30 semi trucks worth of equipment uh, all had to get shipped down south. So we kind of put ourselves out of work there. Uh, this was the team that we had in place up there to work on that. 
um, other things I've worked on. Uh, so when I was working LPD 17, as chief engineer in the Navy calls me up one day. He says, McCoy, got this submarine out in Idaho. Darn thing won't stay down. It keeps popping to the surface. Go out there and fix it, will you? Uh, yes, sir. Will do. So I get out there. So this is a one-third scale uh, geosim of the um, Virginia class submarine. And it's for research, it's for hydroacoustic research and um, um, mostly hydroacoustics is what they use it for. And it's battery powered. So it's got a whole rack of batteries in here. And then it's got an electric motor in the back that, that drives it. And it's got hydrophones all over it and accelerometers and stuff. And it's autonomous, right? It's got a, a pre-programmed uh, flight path. So you take it out in Lake Ponderay, Idaho, and then hit the go button. And it's supposed to submerge, go through their acoustic range they have, do different maneuvers, and then come back and, and return. Well, in the control system, it's got a, a fail safe in it. And the fail safe is if I lose my inputs on my control system, blow ballast tanks and come to the surface. Pretty good sale, fail safe, right? Well, the problem was they were getting all kinds of electromagnetic interference um, due to the way it was built. And so it would submerge, it would start operating. And then all of a sudden the control system couldn't, couldn't get any of its inputs. So it would go to that safety mechanism, blow ballast tanks and pop to the surface. Um, so I went out, I packed my bags, went out there, uh, thought I was gonna be out there for a couple of weeks. It took about two days to figure out what the problem was. Uh, the problem was they had cable trays with big power cables and those cables were connected directly to the power electronics that drive the motor. So you had all kinds of switching going on, very fast switching, created electromagnetic fields. In the same cable trays, they had all the sensor wires and the cables were unshielded. So all the power wires were talking to the sensor wires and the controller was just getting all this noise coming in all of its sensors. And that's why the controller was doing that. So it didn't take long to figure that one out. But that was kind of interesting. My wife likes to laugh about that one because I actually applied to get the job as the officer in charge out there and was told, no, I can't do that because I wasn't qualified in submarines. <laughs> um, and, then the, and then they get me to go out there and fix their submarine that they didn't know how to fix. Um, a few other things I did, and these are some of the things I've done in my consulting career. Uh, did a little bit of work on the, the Constellation class frigate. Uh, I'm currently doing some work on the DDGX, which is the Navy's latest and greatest destroyer. Um, I did a little work for um, a uh, company for a manufacturer who was trying to sell some equipment to one of our allied countries who, uh, who operates German Type 2 and 9 submarines. We we're basically looking at replacing all their batteries with their lead acid batteries with uh, lithium ion batteries, and it was going to extend the range quite a bit. So um, the other sort of half of my career has been research and development. First two big projects I worked on were machinery controls and electric propulsion. Uh, machinery controls, we did the, what was called the standard modern control system. That was the first control system uh, that was network-based and all software-based for the human machine interface. Before that, everything was hardwire point to point, and it was a mimic board with physical dials and, and switches on it. Um, so that was the first system that was all sort of glass cockpit, if you will, for a shipboard control system. Um, took that through testing. Uh, that has since moved on to become the control system for five different classes of US Navy ships that are out there, as well as uh, several international Navy ships. The other big one uh, that I worked on was the integrated power system. Uh, and that's what most of these photos are here. Um, that was a full-scale test. It was the first prototype of a um, full-scale all-electric propulsion system uh, for the US Navy. Um, you can see the, the big propulsion motor under construction here. There's yours truly looking at something. Um, this is the, the stator under construction. 
This is the test site in Philadelphia that we put together. So here's that motor completed. Uh, it's uh, driving a, a water brake for a load. And then the converter to drive that motor is sitting up here. This is some switch gear. And then up these gray cabinets up on the third level are power converters for the ship service, which this was sort of the, uh, the predecessor to the uh, integrated fight through power that's on the Zumwalt class ship. And this is some of that equipment under construction. There's some of our team at, in Rugby UK where we, we spent a lot of time in Rugby because that's where the motor came from. That's where the motor drive came from. Um, and so we, we learned a whole lot about Rugby and all the pubs there. Um, but some of the other stuff I worked on over the years. Uh, so after I left the Navy when I was consulting, started working on hybrid electric drive for DDG 51s. Uh, there's me in the shaft alley of a DDG-51 doing a ship check. Developed the, the algorithm for, do, for, for basically showing the fuel savings possible. Uh, looking at the, sh the speed time profile of the ship and all the folks who have been in my class, we've, we've talked about that. Uh, and how the, the speed time profile interacts with the speed power curve of the ship and interacts with the specific fuel consumption of the engines to allow you to save fuel, even though your transmission efficiency is actually lower. Uh, got started working on reliability. Um, actually, I started working on that at MIT. So this is some stuff that I did with Professor Steve Lieb when I was back at MIT on the faculty. So my job there was to teach the Naval Engineering Program. I didn't have a job to do research there, but I did some because I was interested in it. And so uh, Steve Lieb, he had been a classmate of mine when I was a student there. He, he basically never left MIT. He, he went from PhD, you know, bachelor's, master's, PhD, faculty member. He, he's never left there, never been anywhere else. Really smart guy. Um, but he came up with this non-intrusive load monitoring. He first did it as his PhD thesis, and he outfitted his 74 Chevy Nova with it. And he could tell whether the, when you turn on the fan, to your heater, and this is all mechanical, he could tell whether the damper was in defrost or heat. And that was sort of one of the first applications. Basically what it does is it measures current voltage, multiplies them together to get power, and you come up with this power spectral envelope. And what we did is we were able to look at a whole bunch of different applications on ship. Where these charts are out of is the sewage system, vacuum sewage system on the ship. And so they can tell the difference between a normal set of runs where it, it fits this Erlang distribution versus if you have a leak in your vacuum system, then you're going to have these um, spikes at certain intervals. And the spikes will be, will move around depending upon how big the leak is. And um, so the neat thing is, is it allows you to tell the difference between we're just using the sewage plant more because we've got more people on board using the toilets, right? Versus we got a problem in our system. So that was kind of my first exposure to looking at um, reliability and predicting failures. Went on when I was at Conver team, we did some work on semiconductor reliability, did some comparisons of uh, flat pack versus press pack semiconductors. Press pack are the ones that are look like a hockey puck with the ceramic around them and you squeeze them together. Flat packs are the ones that are just a plastic box with stainless steel on the back and you bolt them down. Um, turns out that um, the, at uh, higher power levels, the, uh, the press pack work, uh, they're much more reliable. Uh, we also started a program there that I didn't finish when I was there, but they have since finished it and it's now a product for sale by GE essentially looking at failures in rotating machines and how to predict them using vibration, uh, temperature, um, and current and voltage measurements. So uh, interesting kind of stuff. Um, so the last one on, on this part is uh, technology development. So this was uh, my portfolio in my last civilian job at the Navy. Um, was I ran the electric ship's office. Uh, and uh, so what we had there is that hybrid electric drive thing that I started out as a consultant. Well, I inherited that when I moved to the Navy 
And so we uh, put together the development for that and we uh, awarded a contract, a 120 some million dollar contract outfitted on 40 some ships. Uh, and then uh, um, ended up only outfitting one because they uh, had some budget cuts and they took away the procurement money. Uh, but it was developed and it works. The uh, Navy just decided that when they changed administrations, they didn't really want to save fuel anymore. wasn't wasn't a priority, so uh, the program got kind of canceled. Um, things that have gone into production: the power conversion module. This is basically a radar power supply um, that we developed for the Flight Three destroyer. Um, we did some uh, gas turbine improvements, basically. Uh, coatings and um, uh, some airflow improvements to the gas turbines to improve efficiency. Uh, we developed energy storage uh, for shit. This is large format uh, lithium battery energy storage. Uh, we sold it as a fuel savings initiative uh, to run on, on a single generator instead of two. Uh, about the same time that that got canceled, they didn't like the idea of running on one generator, even if you had battery backup. So uh, it's now being been repackaged as a uh, uh, mission support to support these uh, electric weapons, lasers, and stuff like that. Um, and then the last thing we did was we de developed new gas turbine generator, again, for that Flight 3 destroyer. Uh, and that's now, that's in service now. Um, so not too bad. We got about three out of the three out of the five uh, got into the service, which is still pretty good for, for development work. Everybody's quiet. Am I putting you to sleep? Okay. So uh, that's kind of my career. Uh, I just want to throw a few parting thoughts out there for students. Um, keep in touch with your classmates, right? So this picture was taken at my Navy retirement party, and these are all cla MIT classmates of mine. So my undergraduate days, I went to a program that had 120-some students, right? I, I don't keep track of anybody from that program. But my graduate program, you know, was eight or ten students a year. So it's people you kind of got to know, just like the program here. You guys are in a fairly small group. You get to know your people, your classmates. You're in all the same classes together. So you can kind of keep track of them. And, you know, I've met people all around the world. This is Ottawa, Canada, uh, my spouse and one of my MIT classmates. And, yeah, uh, learn how to relax and have fun. Nobody can relax as good as a dog can. Um, that's our our little puppy who she spends a whole lot of time relaxing. And those who've been in the, the uh, 332 class, I've had Paul Roden come and he's talked about uh, invest for retirement. Can't emphasize that enough. I didn't start investing to retirement until I was in my late 30s. Um, and if I would started in my 20s, I'd be retired by now. Um, and lastly, uh, yeah, enjoy what you do for a living. Um, and uh, uh, I, I've, I've enjoyed most of the things I've done. I haven't always enjoyed the commute. Um, certainly in Washington, didn't enjoy the commute, but usually enjoyed the job and always to do the best you can. And make time for family. This is the Where's Waldo slide. Um, did I tell you I come from a big family? Um, I was the youngest of eight. My dad was the 16th of 17. Um, yeah. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, get together over time. See, this is recent here at Michigan. It's my two brothers that are remaining and my nephew. Play, we try to get together and play golf a couple times a year. Have more fun. Um, travel if you like it. Just whatever, whatever's fun for you, right? I try and do different things. Uh, Paris, I've uh, been there a few times. Um, this is my bride before we were married. That's in Ensenada, Mexico. This is her entry into the Navy uh, at our wedding. And this is her exit from the Navy at my retirement ceremony. Um, done a little boating. Uh, the one on the lower left is the Straits of Georgia uh, between Vancouver Island and, Brit and mainland British Columbia. Uh, two above that are Chesapeake Bay. Um, we owned a couple, couple of boats on Chesapeake. The camper picture, that's out in Pueblo, Colorado. Um, more fun. I thought since it's Olympic week, uh, throw in the curling. So that was a great surprise for me a couple years ago. Um, 
we went up to Ottawa to visit, uh, again, one of my grad school classmates, uh, Heather on, on your left, the blonde there. Uh, she's one of my grad school classmates who was a Canadian Naval officer, um, has since retired from there and has been managing a shipbuilding program, building ships for the Canadian Coast Guard. Um, and uh, Melissa Smoot, who's a senior executive at, uh, with the US Navy, and they surprised me because I, I was always interested in curling and surprised me with curling lessons at none other than the Royal Canadian Navy Curling Club. So that was a lot of fun. Um, I don't have a good picture of me doing the curling because I kept falling down. Um, I like to try new things, but I'm not a terribly good athlete. Um, and yeah, the bicycling pictures, that's another one of my grad school classmates, Jeff McLaughlin. His daughter just graduated U of M here uh, last year uh, with her master's degree. Can never have too much fun. <laughs> More boating pictures. Play pool. My 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 older brother Randy. Uh, he's the reason that my parents couldn't afford to uh, send us to college. Because uh, in his college days, he his uh, they they were paying for him to go to college, and he studied pool for a semester. And he came home with a grade point average of 1.6. <laughs> now, the funny thing is, is his son, my nephew, Steve, who that's the guy in the yellow here, my nephew, Steve, he followed in his dad's footsteps. The guys, are, Steve's a real athlete. He got all the athletic genes in the family. You know, he was, you know, quarterback of the football team and, you know, starting guard on the basketball team and track and everything. And he had a track scholarship to university. And he studied beer and women <laughs> and he came home with a 0 0.64 gpa that was the end of his scholarship he probably wouldn't like me telling that but it's a true story <laughs> um and yeah so have fun with family travel when you can um limbo picture, I think. it is a limbo picture that's at my sister-in-law's wedding i'll have you know i came in second in the limbo contest <laughs> That's you want to know who came in first? No, the bride <laughs> standing behind me. The bride came in first, but she's only about this tall. So she had a physical advantage. Although she said the wedding dress made it made it even because she did do the limbo in the wedding dress. So that's all I've got. Um, questions? Lisa. Meet your wife. I met my wife in Vancouver, British Columbia when I was stationed on the ship. And uh, I like to tell people that she was just trolling the piers for sailors, but that's not true. Um, there was a program there in the program. It, it, it sounds funny when you say the name, so I'll describe it first. So when you, uh, when you know ships pull into a port like that, if you don't have something set up for the sailors on the ship, they tend to gravitate to bars and get drunk and get in trouble. It's just the way it works, especially U.S. warships, because U.S. warships, no alcohol, a lot of them on the boat. So people tend to overdo it when they go ashore. And so and when we were in Australia, they had a program similar to this. And what it is, is it's for uh, families and people to just agree to, you know, go kind of take in a sailor for a day or two and you know, show them a good time or whatever, show them around. And, and so families do it and stuff. It's called Dial a Sailor is the name of the program. And uh, so her friend had signed the two of them up for Dial a Sailor. And as our ship was pulling into port, our executive officer had these people who had signed up for it. And my roommate on the ship, he said, hey, why don't we try one of those? And so we, he called up this number and she answered the phone and talked for a little bit. And she's, you know, he's like, you know, this is Lieutenant Levitt, such and such and such and such. And, and she's thinking, oh, what about those parking tickets is what she's thinking because she'd forgot she'd signed up for it. <laughs> so anyway, um, we went on a double date. And then the next night, um, my roommate had to stay on the ship because he had the duty and her friend uh, had other plans. So just uh, she and I went out we went to a, um, it was a, a thing that the Canadian Navy had hosted for the US Navy because the whole battle group was in. And there was just no, uh, 
uh, there wasn't many women there. So it was kind of like an engineering classroom. She was like one of, she was like kind of like one of four women there and there's all these sailors. So she felt uncomfortable. So we left that and kind of went out on the town. And to, as I say, the rest is history. And Lisa left for the last part of that. <laughs> Nicole. Yeah. Is alcohol allowed on other countries' warships? Um, on, it depends on the country. Most countries, yes. Um, and, and that's why, so if you have one of these international exercises, we have, you know, and this, all the ships pull into port from like when we used to, on the Pacific, we used to do a rim pack exercise. So that's all Pacific rim countries would get involved in that, go out and do battle exercises and stuff. The parties are never on the U.S. ships, right? Yeah. For your consulting business, did you enjoy being your own boss and did you use a lot of your old contacts for anything? For the consulting business, what was the rest of it? Um, do you like being your own boss? And did you use any of your old contacts from university or uh, prior naval? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes to both. So, yes, I like being my own boss. I mean, I still have my consulting business. You guys probably know I'm, all, I'm only on half-time appointment here at U of M. So I still consult regularly. Uh, and, yes, I... Um, I didn't have to use contacts so much as they used me because, you know, once I kind of hung out my shingle and said, I'm a consultant now, um, I had people calling me up. Um, I, I've never been, I've never heard it for work uh, as a consultant. Uh, in fact, I, I turn work away. Um, but that's not something you can do right out of college, right? You, you've got to have a career and develop a reputation in the industry uh, before you can go do that. Can you tell us a little more about the buffalo on the previous slide? <laughs> well, that's an inside joke for the uh, the juniors. That that buffalo, that, so that was taken at Yellowstone National Park um, about probably four or five years ago when we were out there. Um, and so, yes, the, you'll have to ask one of the juniors. It's it's inside joke with the juniors about the buffalo. <laughs> Yeah. You said you were able to successfully outfit one of the 40 contracted ships with the hydroelectric drive. Yep. What ship was that? Uh, it was the, um, I think it was the Truxton. DDG 103, I think. I think that's right, but I'd, I'd have to go back and check. Okay. Well, the issue, what happened was, is when it got into, when the prototype got into testing at Philadelphia, they were having electromagnetic interference problems. And at that time I had left the program and, and I was consulting and my wife and I were uh, touring the country in our RV. And um, it basically the program got delayed by about a year and a half because of the testing. And then, and then at that point, um, the, uh, the guys in the Pentagon that control the money, uh, they pulled the plug on the procurement funds we had all the R&D funds done. And, and so the ones that were built under R&D money got installed, but um, the procurement money went away. And again, that was also part of change of administration between Obama and Trump administrations. Priorities got changed. And you know during the Obama years, uh, fuel savings was a big deal. And so you could sell almost anything on fuel savings in the Pentagon. Um, and, and during the Trump years, it was not a big deal. Um, in fact, it was a bad deal. Um, and so, um, and, you know, probably, you know, I think with this president, with President Biden, it's probably reversed again. And, and that's part of, you know, like working in the government and dealing with Washington, right, is, you know, the, the, the administration sets the priorities, and that's why they have all those political appointees at the head of every agency, so that political appointee can set the priorities. And, and of course, the downside is, is that, you know, every, every four years or so, you kind of get redirected as to which which direction you're going. Other questions? Yes. How do you do it to your PhD? How do you do it to your PhD? What well, was actually a five year PhD, right? Because I had spent three years going through the master's in naval engineers program. Naval naval engineers program, the way it's set up there, you get more than enough classwork to do a PhD. So all I had to do in that last two years was a thesis. You wanna hear about my thesis? Uh, yeah. Okay, we'll talk about my thesis. Here's my thesis. Um, how much do you know about electric motors? 
Not much? <laughs> okay, so a normal electric motor has a radial air gap. At the time, there's a lot of interest in axial air gap motors. So it's, it's like a pancake, right? So the rotor part here spins around it's, and it's a thin disc. And the um, flux goes across here, the current goes radially, and J cross B, that still gives you a force in the theta direction, which gives you torque. Very torque dense motors, which we thought would be good for propulsion applications for ships, because you need a lot of torque to swing a big propeller around, right? Issue was getting the issue with these big motors is always getting the heat out. So heat transfer is a big deal. So I ended up studying the heat transfer in the motors. So using this geometry, um, I looked at a way to cool it using two phase cooling, a thing called a thermosiphon. Does anybody else know what a thermosiphon is? Okay, so a thermosiphon, here's a picture of one. It is a heat transfer device where you take a liquid and you put it in concert with its vapor. You evacuate all non-condensable gases out of there. So the way you make one, oh, I was gonna bring one in, but I forgot. Uh, the way you make one is you evacuate it. So in my PhD thesis, I learned a lot about vacuum engineering. It's nothing to do with what my thesis was, but I learned a lot about it doing experimental work. Vacuum all the, all the uh, gases out, put in your liquid. The two I dealt with mostly, I tried water for a while, but water's a pain in the rear to work with. Pure water is a real pain. So I ended up using ethanol and methanol for my two fluids. And you, so you got a liquid there, you heat it, the liquid's gonna vapor, start vaporizing eventually. Vapor flows up here, you cool up here, that vapor is going to recondense, and then gravity is going to let that vapor fall back down. So, has anybody here ever seen the Alaska pipeline? Besides me, couple. Okay, so you you know those things that stick up off of the the stands? Those are called heat pipes. And what those do is they keep the heat from the pipeline from melting the permafrost. And they are like a thermosiphon, except instead of relying on gravity they rely on a wick structure along the wall here and they use capillary action to bring the fluid back. And the neat thing about heat pipes is you can actually create a thermal diode or a thermal check valve where heat only flows one way, which is kind of neat. Um, with the thermosiphon, they're simpler because you don't have the, the wick structure. Um, but what we were doing is we're putting a thermosiphon on a rotating reference frame. So the thermosiphon here was being flung around like this, right? And so instead of earth gravity, we were dealing with centrifugal forces, right? So omega squared R forces. And so that changes all the equations of the heat transfer of the evaporation and the condensation. And so I developed these relationships for the heat transfer in both laminar wavy laminar uh, regimes. This is evaporator, also did the condenser. Developed an experimental setup where I manufactured these heat pipes. I also learned a lot about machining. I was pretty good with a milling machine and a lathe by the time I got done with my PhD. And uh, so we made a heat pipe here where we got, this is showing horizontal, right? So this is the, this is the heater section here where we have the liquid and the vapor here, and this is the condenser section. And so I put a bunch of thermocouples on here. I measured um, both liquid and vapor temperature. What's not shown is I also had a pressure transducer in here to measure pressure. And with all those measurements, I built a rig that would take it and fling it around and, uh, and take measurements off of it. And from that, got a bunch of data and was able to validate the theory. And what all this stuff shows you is, this is a theoretical Nusselt number versus the experimental value. So if everything's right, it should be right along the diagonal. And you see it is above about 10 to the three. Below 10 to the three, something else is happening. What we figured out what's happening is the pool boiling, and that's why that pool boiling line is up here, because we figured out that this is becoming a mixture of evaporation along the wall and pool boiling. Let me go back to the heat pipe here. 
So there's a section here where you have evaporation along the wall, and then you'll have a pool in the bottom. I've kind of exaggerated the pool here, but mostly this, and you have a little pool at the bottom. And if you get a mixture of pool boiling and evaporation, then this relation only holds for the evaporation section, right? And so that's what happens at the lower Nusselt numbers is we're getting a mixture of the two uh, things happening. And eventually this would go all, all over to pool boiling and down, but I didn't take data down at those. I couldn't get, I did, my rig was not set up to take data at such low Nusselt numbers. Um, so we looked at different um, L over D ratios of the thermosiphon geometry, different materials and different gravity values. And one of the interesting things I was able to look at is everybody remembers Coriolis force from physics, right? Well, we we're actually able to show the existence of the Coriolis force, which was kind of neat. And the way we we're able to do that is all those temperature probes along the length of that thermosiphon, I kept them either on the leading edge or the trailing edge. And so as you fling it around, the fluid is going to go what? It's going to like want to move to the trailing edge. And so the, the film on the trailing edge will be thicker. On the leading edge, it's going to be thinner. And so by doing it in different directions, the way you look at this is look at it across. So we find one. So we have 46G as the X in normal condition. 46G in the reverse condition is this funky looking thing. So the funky looking thing versus the X. Here it is here. So here's the reverse condition and here's the normal condition. So there's the difference in temperature between the two conditions. And that's telling me that in the um, reverse condition, the thermocouples are on the leading edge with the thinner um, film. And with the thinner film, I've got a lower temperature difference, which is exactly what we would expect. So we kind of proved the existence of the Coliaris. Coriolis force. And that was my doctoral thesis. And yes, it was two years of hard work, a number of all nighters, hardest I ever worked in my life. And I almost didn't finish in two years. But it's the other thing is when the Navy's telling you you're done in two years, whether you finish or not, it puts kind of an incentive on you to put as much work as in because you don't want to go for five. We did. When I was in the faculty there, we had one Navy guy went for five years. They even let him stay another semester and he was nowhere near to finish his PhD. So he left after five years, five years of his Navy time as a student, which doesn't really count towards your career. It counts towards your retirement because you don't advance in your career at all. And so he, this guy had five years and he didn't even get his PhD out of it. Other questions? I can't believe we're going this long. I think everybody just wants lunch now, right? Okay.